Good evening and welcome. I am excited to have you with me tonight. Tonight I'm going to share with you several iridology markers that teach us about the nervous system. As we do this, I want you to remember that every iridology marker can have more than one interpretation. It can lead us to more than one piece of information. So as we do that, I'm going to be guiding you to see how the markers we're looking at are about the nervous system tonight. If you've been with me on other webinars, we've talked about some of these markers before, and we've looked at them for how they can teach us about another kind of a body system or another kind of a health concern. So when you see me talking about these markers tonight, the way I'm going to talk about them, don't let that confuse you. Don't let that get tangled in your brain. Just know that every marker can, can take us in several directions, and it's all about the quality of the questions we ask. I thank you for coming. We are going to be together for about 90 minutes tonight, so I hope you've booked off that much time to spend with me. I intend to make this 90 minutes very well spent. I want you to, to leave our, our meeting tonight, leave our workshop tonight, with information you can actually use with your very next client if you are a practitioner. So regardless of whether your forte is herbology or nutrition or aromatherapy or body work of some kind, I promise that you will leave tonight with information you can use. So I want to get to know you a little bit. And I used to do this by way of polls, but I think it's more effective to do it uh, by having you type things in. I'm going to ask you to play all in. We're going to have fun in the sandbox tonight. So come and play with me, will you please? I'd like you to type in into that question box, your little question chat box there. What is your background in holistic healing? Do you have nutrition training? Are you a herbalist? Do you have uh, massage or Reiki or some other body work? Do you do aromatherapy? I'm going to give you just a minute to let you type things in. Oh, we've got them coming in already. This is great. Awesome. Someone's got lightning fingers and a fast connection tonight. So please do play with me. We've got a massage therapist who is also a herbalist. That's a nice combination. And an RNCP. Wow, is she ever trained? Okay, so we're just looking to see who else has got what here. Okay, we've got lots going on. What else do we have? I know um, I know some of the names that are on my list, but I'd love it if you'd all weigh in. That little question box, just type it in for me. I like to tweak my presentations on the fly. And so if I know what your background is, I can actually customize what we're doing a little bit to help you get more out of this. Ooh, we've got aromatherapy and we've got the nutrition with the RNCP and the ROHP. Lovely, nice group tonight. I'm so glad you showed up. We're gonna have a lot of fun. Okay. Just before we do that, you if you I know some of you have a bit of iridology background, but I would love it if you would also just type in, do you have any iridology background? And if you do, what is it? Is it a Jensen background? Did you study with Dr. Pesek? Or did you, um, are, do you have a constitutional background? Let me know what you've got, again, because different styles use different languaging, and I can translate on the fly. I do a lot of things on the fly. And so um, I can translate on the fly and help you to, to make sure you've got the information. And uh, I'm hearing that someone has a bad echo. Usually that means that you have a microphone that is turned on and, um, and you have your speakers on as well. So your speakers are playing into your microphone. So you may want to mute your own microphone or if you're on a laptop or a tablet, there's a little, I don't know exactly where to find it, my kids have to always find it for me but there will be a little something that you can click to turn off the echo 
Um, the other way to get around the echo is if you can use earbuds or a headphone because that will usually cut out all the rest of it and um, all, all of that feedback that you're getting. So we've got someone who's got some Jensen, a couple of you with Jensen, mm -hmm. and some that have no background. So we've got a bit of variety here. This will be good. Okay. So for those of you who've never done iridology before, you don't know anything about it, I want to run some ideas past you before we get into the iridology. But I also want those of you who have, bit, have iridology to weigh in on this as well and to think about, about this as we go. I want to point out three challenges that most of us face, particularly if we're working with nutrition, but also if we are working with herbology. And um, these are challenges that can make it really difficult for us to practice effectively. So the first challenge is we don't know exactly where to start when we're making recommendations. And because of that, we don't know how to set our therapeutic, therapeutic priorities. Oftentimes when we're in training, especially if it's for nutrition or herbology, we are taught to write these massive case studies where, um, where we outline everything that the client could possibly need to know. And what that means is that we were not taught how to pick a starting point, how to, to ask the question, but what came first, what came before that, what came before that, and just keep asking them, but why, but why, but why, but where, but where, but where, but how, but how, but how, right? It's like the, the little four-year-old asking daddy, but why, but why, but why? And that's what we need to learn to do when we are doing our client work is ask, but where did this begin? What, what comes before the symptom? that we're seeing now, what came before that, what came before that, what came before that, and take it back until we are at the root. We're, but we're not really taught how to do that in school. And that's a huge, huge problem because it makes it very difficult for us to function properly then as holistic therapists. Often what that also makes us do is it makes us want to go and do all this extra research and program development outside of the client time. So we've met with our client, we've done our one-on-one, -on -one, whatever we do for an intake, and we sent them away, maybe with a little bit of homework, but probably not. And then we're gonna go away and we're going to do two or three or four hours of research and program development. We're going to write this beautiful report as if it was a case study when, from when we were in school. Then when our client comes back, we give them this gorgeous report but we didn't get paid for that time we spent writing the report. And that's going to be important because when you stop and think about it, and I'm not all about the money, this isn't about money grabbing at all. But if you are spending two or three or four hours, let's go with three for easy figuring of your own time, writing up these beautiful reports and you're not getting paid for it, your income is somewhere between 20 and 25% of what it should be. Now, unless you're charging three or $400 for that first session and a follow-up session, you are really not making enough money to live on. And that's a problem because you have your business bills to pay, your rent, uh, upgrading your computer and your equipment probably. You've probably got insurance that you need to pay, professional membership fees that you need to pay. And then, and then you've got to live. Somehow you've got to pay for groceries, you've got to pay for the rent on your home and the insurance on your home and your vehicle and all that kind of stuff. But if you're only making 25 or 30 percent of what you could make, you may not be being able to pay your bills. And you may be in that place in your brain if you've been struggling for a couple of years thinking, I need to get a real job. This isn't working. I'm just going to give up because this does not work. Okay, we, and that's not a good thing because you have gifts. You have things that you need to give to people and people need you. They need what you've got. You are meant to help someone. If you've got the knowledge, you are meant to help, help someone. But if you quit, you can't help them at all. Does that, does that sound about right to you? If that sounds right, raise your hand that you need to make enough money to pay your bills in order to stay in business. Does that sound like a, a correct principle to you? Yeah? Thank you. 
Thank you. Appreciate that. It's so important because we are givers, aren't we? We like to give. We give from our heart when we work with our clients. But we need to remember that even when we give from our heart, we need to receive back. The last thing that I want to mention on this one is that we make these beautiful case study reports and our client comes back for their second appointment and we give them this report. This report contains everything they could possibly ever need to know for the rest of their lives. Amen. Right. And in doing that, one of about three different things happens. Number one, they are overwhelmed with it, but they figure, okay, I can grab the one or two pieces of information I need and ignore the rest. And then they never come back because they've got the one or two pieces they need. That does not serve them. That does not serve you. Nobody benefits. The second one is that they look at, at everything you've provided, all this information. They throw their hands up and they go, I could never do all that. I am not that perfect. I simply can't do it and they leave without having even absorbed anything. Again, they're not gonna come back. That means that they lose and so do you. With what I'm going to teach you today, I am going to show you, begin showing you, how you can work things so that your clients want to keep coming back. I've got clients in my files that, I, that I've been working with for 30 years, that's three zero years. They were with me in the infancy of my business. And it's not that I see them every month. I haven't been seeing them every month for 30 years. That would be ridiculous. I would not be doing my good job and they would be taken for a ride with if that was what was happening. But after we've got them established and they're doing well and they are understanding the things that I've taught them, then they go off for a little while. Sometimes it's six months, sometimes it's a year, might even be two years. But when life starts to change, when their body starts to change, they always come back, right? Because they know that I'm going to take them another step further. I'm going to look at where they're at now and we'll meet two or three times, get them back on track for how their body's changed. And then they'll go away again for six months, a year, two years, but then they'll come back. Now, the beautiful thing about that is I'm not always having to find new clients because the ones that I haven't seen in a while are coming back periodically and I get a few new clients along the way. So I'm never going, oh my goodness, how am I going to pay my bills? Right? So that's really an important consideration. When, when we talk about iridology and learning how to integrate it. Many years ago, when I first started teaching iridology, I had a, a student come to me who was a naturopath. She had been trained by one of the biggest iridology teachers in the US at the time. She'd been trained eight years before we met. She bought a beautiful iridology camera and she left it sitting in the corner in its original box. So it sat there for eight years before she and I connected. And she shared with me that the reason she'd never opened it was because, yes, she learned iridology, but no, she didn't learn how to integrate it into what she does. So she had given up totally on iridology, but I convinced her that I could help, that I could help her learn how to do this well. She trusted me. That was, that was a good thing for both of us. We had a great working relationship. We still do. She came to the classes by the end of the second class. So this is after four hours with me, after just four hours. The next day, I got an email from her and she said, I'm finally getting it. I get it. I see how this is supposed to work. She said, and I'm, I've taken my camera, I set it up, and I'm starting to take pictures of my client's eyes now. I was so excited. I could hardly contain myself because she was getting the idea of integrating it. And that's where I'm going to help you go today. So how do I know that those are challenges that you are probably facing? I've been there myself. Yep, I have. You should have seen how complicated the programs were when I first started up. Oh my goodness. I can't believe any of those people that are still with me came back. I really can't. They are, were so kind to keep coming back while I figured this out because no one taught me how to do what I'm going to teach you. 
This is what I've learned from nearly 40 years in the industry. And I've interviewed a lot of other holistic nutritionists and herbalists and holistic practitioners. Almost all of them have been there before. Some of them are still there now and they're stuck. A few have been able to move out of it, but most of them are stuck. If you feel like that's you, that you are kind of stuck, that you overwhelm your clients, that you don't know how to create programs in your consultations, let's have you raise your hand. And I promise there's not going to be any follow-up phone calls and me calling to harass you to sign up for something or anything. But if you feel like you could benefit from learning how to integrate things and keep your client work during your client hours, let's have you raise your hand. Excellent. Thank you so much. So who am I and why do I feel like I should be able to teach you something? This is me, Judith Cobb. I've been a holistic health coach since 1981, a master herbalist since 83, a nutritional consulting practitioner since 94. In 2016, I added the natural nutrition clinical practitioner. In 93, I became a certified iridologist and I pretty much started teaching iridology right away. But I decided in 2016 to become a certified comprehensive iridology instructor. I've been teaching wellness professionals since 1985. And you know, back when I started, I don't know how many of you were in the industry back then, but back then there was almost no education available. There was some, most of my training was as, as I was men mentored and I worked in a holistic practitioner's office. So most of it was more like an apprenticeship for me than it was actual classroom training. I added actual courses as I went. But I've um, back then, there wasn't anything available locally where I live. In order for us to learn things, the courses were mostly in Arizona and California. And they were all correspondence, which meant snail mail days. You order your class. They mailed me cassette tapes and written material. And I would do the work. I would mail that back to them, wait for them to market and mail me the next piece. It took forever. Ever. But that's all that was available. So as I learned things, I started teaching. There was a need and I decided to fill it. I am also the wife of one, the mom of seven, and the grandma of seven. And you know, along the way, I've made just about every mistake you could possibly make in setting up and working to build a holistic practicing business even a holistic teaching business. One of my goals tonight is to begin showing you how to avoid some of those same mistakes. If I can keep you from making the mistakes I made, that's wonderful. And if I can show you how to stop making some of those mistakes, I know that's a hard thing to think that we're making mistakes. But if I can help you to see mistakes that you are making that are holding you back professionally and help you to move forward, that just makes my day. So hopefully that's what we're going to accomplish tonight. Iridology can help you eliminate intake forms except for your waiver or release form. You always need the legal side of things taken care of, but those intake forms are obnoxious, absolutely obnoxious. I um, have worked with practitioners and, and interviewed them where they said they have a 20 page intake form. I simply wouldn't do it. I wouldn't. That it's going to ask so many questions that are irrelevant to me. I'm not going to waste my time and I choose to not waste my client's time. Well, iridology can help you start creating deep rapport from the moment you start the consultation. Instead of starting with you looking down to read that awful intake form or equally as bad, looking at your computer to read a digital intake form, right? Rapport is not created by looking away from someone. It's created by looking at someone. With iridology, you're looking at them, you're right in their face, and you know, you're really close to them. The rapport develops very, very quickly. 
Iridology can help you do a core assessment in less than five minutes. Know the right questions to ask. Stop wasting time on questions that have nothing to do with your client. You can, it'll help you prioritize what needs to be done, dealt with first, and to create their, a therapeutic priorities list for future consultations. In this first five minutes, where you're looking at their eyes, you're not just looking, you're talking, you're asking questions, and you're also making little notes, little point form notes about what you see. And then, again, on the fly, as you learn the skill and learn the craft, you're able to say, hmm, well, her answers to these questions mean that that's where I need to start. And you can then outline four or five or six very, very sketchy outline point form um, ideas of where you're going in the next four or five or six appointments, right? The beauty of that is your clients don't want a one-off miracle. They want someone they can count on. They want someone who's going to be there, who knows their case, who's going to follow their progress and coach them a, one day at a time, one appointment at a time. And if you've created that roadmap for where you want to go, where you see your client needs to go, what they need to work on, and you share that with them, it increases their trust in you. You've got it together. You have a starting point and you know, you may not know exactly where you're going to end up, but you have a map for the first four or five meetings anyways. And that really helps your clients to want to keep coming back. Iridology will help you eliminate that unpaid homework time. There's nothing wrong with doing re research on a topic that you're really interested in. If a client comes in with a health concern that you've never worked with before, by all means, do homework, do research, but don't spend your own time writing big fancy reports. It's not going to pay off. And iridology can also help you to stop overwhelming your clients. That is so, so important. Overwhelm does not work for anybody. Does this sound too good to be true? If that sounds too good to be true, that iridology can do all that, I want you to raise your hand. Oh, good. You're all believing me then. That's great because it is not too good to be true. It is absolutely the way it is the way it works. All right, let me catch up with my notes here. Sometimes I ad lib and I get off track with my notes. There we go. Now you may have heard that in order to do iridology, you need to have a big fancy camera. You know, and when you go online and you search for iridology and you see pictures of eyeballs, close up eyeballs that people have posted, you'll see everything from really lousy ones done with a smartphone, right up to really beautiful ones done with a camera like this. <coughs> and so when you see that, you think, well, I don't wanna do this if I'm gonna have lousy photos, but I also do not have $5,000 to spend on a camera. And I'm gonna tell you up front, you don't need this to start with. You grow into this, right? So don't ever think that you need to spend a lot of cash to do iridology well. What you really need will cost you maybe $50, which is a little more affordable than 5,000. This is my very first original set of iridology equipment, a pen light, and an eight power jeweler's loop. So that's an 8X magnifying device. This is a, um, a more recent acquisition and I bought this one on Amazon and I'm gonna tell you why you need what kinds of stuff here. This came with three interchangeable lenses, a 2X, a 5X and a 10X. Love it, love it, love it. I really suggest having something like this. Now, the beauty of this is, number one, you can interchange the lenses, lenses, right? So you are going to be able to use the 2X, kind of get a feel for the eye, bump up to the 5X, see some detail, bump up to the 10X, and see things you never knew existed. 
This also has the built-in light, which means that you're using just one hand to look in this person's eye. That's kind of nice. The one drawback to this is the light, you have no way of changing where the light shines in relation to your lens. And sometimes we want to move the light around independently from the lens. And so for that reason, it's good to have a really good pen light that has a nice white light. So a good pen light and a, a good triple change, if you will, magnifying light is all you need to start. I use this kind of a setup. I used this, this exact setup for probably four or five years before I decided to buy a camera. Okay, and this is actually my third camera that I've owned in the, the many years that I've been doing iridology. So don't go thinking you need to spend a wad. You really don't. All right. I need a show of hands here now again. Did you have to study anatomy and physiology in order to get whatever nutrition or body work or other training you that you've got under your belt. So Lindsay's got her A and P, excellent. And Ursula does too, that's lovely. Anybody else? I just need to know how deep I need to go into this page. Okay, so it looks like I need to kind of do, do this at a really good solid introductory level. Excellent. We are talking about nervous system tonight. We're going to have a lot of fun with this. And okay, and Susan says she's got her NP. Lovely, Susan. Thank you for weighing in on that. In the nervous system, it breaks down into two systems. These It all falls under nervous system under that umbrella. The first is the central nervous system. So this is your brain and your spinal cord. This is primarily about sensory and visceral kinds of feedback and responses. And we're not even going to worry about central nervous system. You just needed to know it exists. Then we have the peripheral nervous system. So this is the nerves that come right out of the spinal cord. So the cranial nerves that mostly wrap around the face and the spinal nerves, which are the nerves that come out of the, the spinal cord and enervate the rest of the body. This breaks down into two different pathways, the afferent and the efferent. The afferent starts with your sensors, with your nerve receptors, and it sends the messages up to the brain. The efferent is how the messages go from the brain back down into your body. Okay, so we're going to focus on the efferent because with the efferent, it breaks down into som somatic and autonomic. In the somatic, this is the voluntary muscle control. If you're sitting at a desk and you think, I need to go get a pencil, it's the thinking that tells, that fuels the somatic, that triggers those neurons to get you out of your chair, to walk across the room, to where the pencils are, to reach down and pick it up. So these motor nerves or motor neurons are enervating the skeletal muscles to create movement. And we have control over this most of the time. We also have the efferent that comes down to the autonomic nervous system. So this is the involuntary system. You don't have to think about this one little bit. This breaks down further into the sympathetic and parasympathetic. This is where we're going to spend most of our time tonight. The sympathetic has sympathy for whatever situation you are in. It creates the responses of fight, flight, or freeze. So I want you to imagine you're driving down a major highway, lots of traffic, and somebody, you might have some, adject some adjectives for them, comes speeding up behind you and swerves around you, cutting in and out of traffic and cuts you off and then slams on his brakes and you slam on your brakes to stop. That response that you feel, the gas, maybe the shriek, the racing heart, all of that, that is the sympathetic kicking in. Once all the traffic is cleared and the person who did that has moved out of the way and 
you maybe hopefully didn't get violent with them. It's your parasympathetic that it kicks in to bring you back. It restores balance. We often describe the parasympathetic as rest, digest, and procreate because those are the kinds of things that happen when we're feeling really chill and really mellow. Let's have a look at how these parts of the nervous system actually affect your physiology. Now, you know some of these things. So you know that that sympathetic increases your heart rate. You've experienced that. If you are more than about four years old, you've experienced that, right? You breathe faster. Your blood pressure goes up. Your pupils dilate. They get bigger. The little story I like to use on this one goes like this. You're in a lovely mountain park, sitting at a, a picnic table. You've driven up there. Your car's parked a little ways away, sitting at this picnic table, and you're eating a lovely picnic lunch. And you hear some chuffing coming from the bushes. Chuffing is the sound that bears make. And then you hear the twigs breaking and movement in the brush. Your heart's starting to race just a little. You're thinking, nah, couldn't be. Don't think so. No, it's not a bear. I know it's not a bear. It's, it's all okay. It's not a bear. Meanwhile, your heart's still picking up. Your breathing is getting a little faster, a little shallower. Your blood pressure's starting to go up. And the chuffing gets louder and you look up and there is a bear. He wants your lunch. He might even want you for lunch. So you leap away from that picnic table. You race to your car. You get in the car. You lock the door because we all know bears know how to unlock or open car doors, right? But you lock the door just for safety. <laughs> and in this whole process, your stomach has stopped and you've been sweating profusely. And all of this is because you need the increased heart rate, the respiration and the blood pressure to get the nutrients and the oxygen to your large muscles to get you away from the bear. You don't need to be worrying about that sandwich right now. Sending any kind of energy to the stomach to digest that sandwich or that picnic is just taking it away from where you need it for survival, right? You need it in those big muscles. But once you are locked in the car, and the bear is really trying his best to open the car door. Maybe he's just scratching your paint. Who knows? Your heart rate starts to calm down. Your breathing starts to calm down. Your blood pressure starts to settle. Your pupils start to come back to their normal size. Oh, I forgot to tell you about dilation. Let, we'll go back to that in a moment. Your digestion starts up because you don't want that lunch putrefying in your stomach and your sweating stops. Now, why would the pupils get large and small based on sympathetic and parasympathetic? Your pupils get large when you are sympathetic stimulated so that you actually don't have to turn your head quite so far to see what's chasing you. Dilated pupils increase your peripheral vision. When you're perfectly safe, you don't need to be looking over your shoulder you'll be just fine, the pupils can come back down. So I'd like you to type in the chat box and I need everybody to play in all in on this or we're just not gonna have fun tonight. I would like to know what are some of the symptoms you've seen, maybe in your clients or in yourself or in a family member, when that person is stressed? When that person is functioning under significant stress, what symptoms do you see? What changes about them? What do they complain about? Okay, I'm going to give you a minute to type everything in. Sometimes we've got faster internet connections and those answers come in really quick. And if it's a slower connection, it might take a moment for it to get here. And if you're anything like me, my typing is lousy. So I end up having to delete and retype and oh my goodness. 
Oh, Larissa, those are really good ones. People become uncooperative and irritated. Mm. High blood pressure, says Helen, along with dilated pupils and digestive issues. Yep, those are really good ones too. What else have you seen? What else have you experienced? Ooh, here's a whole bunch more. Yes. Blushing, excitement, getting loud, irritable, constipation or diarrhea. Ooh, Ursula, those are good ones too. You've obviously worked with people who have some stress in their lives. Headaches, stomach upset, bowel issues. Well done, Lindsay. Those are also really good ones. Thank you. Pacing. Yeah, trying to just burn it off like the walking is going to make everything better. Well, and actually it does help to keep the cortisol in check a little bit to be physically active. So not a bad thing to do, but it certainly, um, it tells us that there is stress. Problem sleeping. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Sleep issues also right on. Oh, you are hot tonight. You're just right on a roll. Well done. And if you're still typing, please finish and do click the send button. And um, I will take a moment to look at them when they come in. Irritability, that got mentioned a few times. Chronic poor sleep. Yep. Inflammation, that was the only one I think that didn't get mentioned. Elevated blood pressure. Indigestion. Chronically cold hands and or feet. Remember that when we are under the significant influence of the sympathetic nervous system, the circulation to the extremities is cut off. The body is hoarding the circulation for the core. And so we'll often see cold hands and cold feet. And muscle tension, which could lead to headaches. It could lead to muscle cramping. It could lead to lots of different things. Okay. Fabulous. Thank you for playing with me on that one. That was fun. Let's look at some eyes now. All right. We're going to look at several different signs. And as we look at these, I'll tell you a little bit about each person and try to give context for asking the questions that you would want to ask. This is a young man in his mid-20s. He had a really interesting childhood in that he was raised, born in the Philippines, and for the first about four years of his life, he was raised in a monastery with monks. His parents sent him away as a tiny, tiny toddler to go live with the monks. And what kind of stress would that create for a child, right? And now as a 24 year old, he suffers with depression. And since the age of 17, he has also suffered with gout. Now, any of you think that that's a little young to be dealing with gout? Yeah, not the best scenario. So when we're talking about contraction furrows, we are looking at these lines that are coming around here that look like they're trying to make a bullseye or a target on the eye. These are inherited. They're not earned. He was born with these. And what these tell us up front is that he's going to be a little more sensitive to stress and he's probably actually going to be living at least a little bit in the edge of always being sympathetic active. Right? So he's always expecting, he's always waiting for the bomb to drop. He's always got a little more adrenaline in his system than his body really needs. Okay, so that's not where we want him to be. And even though that's his genetic tendency, if we do the right things, we can help that to calm down. These contraction furrows won't go away, but we can help things to calm down. So what kinds of questions do you think you would ask someone about their stress if you knew that little bit um, that little bit about them. And Helen asks, is this the same as stress rings from Jensen? Yes, yes, same sign, potentially slightly different slant on them, Helen. What do you think you would ask him? You know a little bit about him already. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll lead off, give you some hints. 
the first thing that I would ask him is, how does stress show up in your body? How do you know? How does your body let you know when you are stressed? Now, because I suspect he's actually had stress all his life beyond what it should be, he probably doesn't even have an answer for that. This is his normal. Doesn't everybody feel like this? So we may have to press a little further and ask him, does depression get worse for you when things are not going well? Does depression get worse for you when people around you are not being supportive, when they're being critical? Do you end up with any kind of muscle tension when when these kinds of things are happening, when people are being critical or when you've got too much to do and you don't know how you're going to get it all done? Do you have muscle tension with that? What about sleep? Tell me about sleep. Do you fall asleep easily? Are you able to sleep through the night? Do you wake up feeling refreshed? Right, so when I see these contraction furrows, those are the kinds of questions I'm going to ask him. These contraction furrows specifically mean his body burns through calcium, magnesium, B vitamins, and vitamin C in record time. Helen offers, how was your digestion? That's another brilliant question to ask someone who has contraction furrows. How's your digestion? And you may need to break it down for them. Do you get heartburn? Do you end up burping and belching a lot when you're under stress? Does it go to your intestines? Do you end up constipated or have diarrhea? And you may need to break that down because different people have different understandings of constipation and diarrhea. All right, so we're going to ask all those questions. What we've done with this fellow, and the challenge here is that um, in amongst all this, he's got really poor self-esteem. And so for him to be successful with anything for more than about five minutes is a huge, huge step forward. He, his habit was to drink two liters, for those of you in the States, that's about two quarts of soda pop every day. Every day. His diet is a really awful mix of easy, traditional Filipino and fast food Canadian. Does that raise, have any alarms going off for any of you? It sure does for me. And his blood sugars are up and down like a roller coaster, which adds to the stress of his nervous system, right? Because if your blood sugars are up and down and up and down, your body's always going into sympathetic mode as those sugars are crashing. So what we've done with him is we have started out really, really gently. And we've suggested that he reduce his pop to one liter a day. And the practical solution there is to buy it in one liter bottles instead of two liter bottles and just keep it down to sipping one liter a day. I know those of you who have the nutrition background are cringing at the thought of that, but there's no way we can take all of it away all at once. We have to have baby steps. The next thing we suggested is that he should be adding a little bit of protein to every meal. So he needs protein at breakfast, protein at lunch, and protein at supper. And again, needed to coach him through, here are some easy ideas. When he's depressed, he all he can eat pretty much that he'll look for is like potato chips and pop, right? He won't cook for himself. And so it had to be, well, let's get you some nuts. Let's get you some eggs that you could boil really easily. You know, if you need to buy the meat prepared, go to the grocery store and buy a roasted chicken that you can just literally eat off the bone. Make it easy. Don't make it hard. Make it easy. So we get limited success for periods of time, and then he hits a speed bump, and then we have to start all over again. But he is trying, and that's what we always applaud with him, is that he is trying and it gradually gets better and better. And, you know, one of these days he's going to have great success. The, this is the eye of a 22 month old toddler. 
Again, we said that these contraction furrows are inherited. She's done nothing to put them there. Now, this little girl is the sweetest little thing you'd ever care to meet. She has amazing manners, and her parents are raising her really well in a lot of ways. They are uh, they don't let her get away with being mean or nasty to anybody. Um, they really coach her as to how to play nicely with people, how to be nice to people. Um, they have a routine for her, particularly a bedtime routine, and that is so important. This little girl, again, with all of these contraction furrows, is really prone to living in that sympathetic zone. So anything that is not a normal routine for her runs the risk of tossing her into a sympathetic response. And so her parents have been very, very wise to the point where they have that set bedtime ritual especially. You know, after supper, well, we're going to have a bath now. And then we're going to put on jammies. Then we're going to have a snack and to brush our teeth. And then there's going to be some songs and some stories and a cuddle. And then it's to bed. And they've done a tremendous job with that, uh, with keeping her in a bit of a schedule that helps her to feel very calm and very safe. And that works well while these children are little. As she gets older, they can start throwing little twists in once in a while. And she will do fine with that. She loves to cook. She loves her veggies. Her parents have uh, liked to get her in the kitchen cooking. Her daddy is a chef in a, a fairly decent restaurant. And so they like to get her in the kitchen. And she's these were taken about eight or ten months ago. So she's coming up to almost three. But she can she can really do a few things in the kitchen. Kind of puts me to shame. Yeah, she's pretty good at that. So they, they spend a lot of family time. With a child like that, if with a child, not just like that, but with a child who has contraction furrows, what you are likely to see if they're out of balance is demanding, whining, crying, temper tantrums. When I see that, I always think of blood sugars out of balance, right? So when we have someone with contraction furrows, if the blood sugars go out of balance, we're going to see a response to that. So we want to keep the blood sugar stable. So just like we did for the previous client, we make sure that these, these parents knew to feed this little girl protein at least three times a day. How many of you have ever had to work with a child who had ADD or ADHD? If you have, please raise your hand. Ursula, excellent, thank you. Anybody else? And Susan and Lindsay, lovely, thank you. All right, thank you. These are the eyes of an 11-year-old boy who uh, the school psychologist sent them to a uh, a psychologist who can be very interventive and the recommendation was Ritalin. Now this little boy comes from a fabulous family. When he comes for his appointments, usually it's the dad that brings him, but if the mom is available, they both come. And I think that's just lovely. It shows a lot of support for this child. As, as we started working together and the diagnosis was from the doctors was ADHD, the parents did not want to go to Ritalin. They really didn't. They wanted to avoid that at all cost. This is, with all these contraction furrows, a little boy who needs constant stimulation, right? But because he has contraction furrows, the stimulation can overstimulate him. He needs a real low key, little bit of stimulation, not a lot, just a little bit, just to help him focus. Often what I find is kids that are ADHD, and I don't like to put it that way, let me change that. Kids who have ADHD are often kinesthetic learners. And that's why they want to be up and about in the classroom. That's why they want to be tapping their foot or flicking their pencil or you know, shooting spit wads or whatever. They really aren't trying to be naughty. 
they're trying to learn and they learn best through their body. So we did a couple of things with this little boy as we got to know him. You know, he was having problems falling asleep at night. We asked him about that. We asked him about his digestion and that was just fine. Asked him what he does when he got stressed. And at 11, he didn't understand the context of that quite yet. So I asked the mom and dad, if he doesn't get his way, what happens? And we're talking royal meltdowns, really not pretty. So then we started talking about diet. What do you eat for breakfast? Well, it was usually a sugary cold cereal. Okay, you seeing a problem with that like I did? What do you have for lunch? Well, lunch is packed, but there was always some junk food in there. You know, there's the good stuff. And I, so I had to ask, what comes back home in the lunch kit? And of course, it's usually the good stuff that comes back home. And the junk food is what got eaten. So I had to ask, is there an after-school snack? Nope. And what about supper? Well, supper was usually a serving of protein, some kind of a starch, and a serving of vegetables, and that's it. So we started at, the, at ground zero with this. We started with, in the classroom, he needs something that can quietly keep his hands occupied. And if we can keep his hands moving with something that's really quiet, we can keep his brain engaged for learning. That'll be our first step. So if you remember what Gumby and Pokey were, raise your hand. Any of you know what Gumby and Pokey are? Okay, oh, Susan, yeah, you might be my vintage. Okay, awesome. I'm, one of these days I'm gonna get pictures of them and put them in here. Thank you, Susan. Gumby and Pokey were cartoons from when I was a little girl. And they were, even on the cartoon, they were rubber poseable figures that engaged. One was a horse and one was a green man thing. But they still make them. And they're still rubberized, they're still poseable. And so I said, get him a Gumby and a Pokey to put in his desk and he can play with folding their arms and bending their legs and things like that. So they got permission from the teachers to do that. Then I said, we gotta fix breakfast. Right, what did he need at breakfast instead of a sugary cereal? What do you think I told them? What would you tell him? It's the key thing that needs to happen at breakfast time. Protein, thank you, Larissa, thank you so much. Protein, so we got them, gave them some protein ideas and got that started. Suggested swapping out some of what was in his lunch for, and fats, yes, Lindsay, absolutely. He needs healthy fats too, doesn't he? Absolutely, I agree. So for lunchtime then, we had them swap out the junk foods and had them replace it with some really high quality protein bars so that he still had something that felt like a treat, but it was gonna pad up his protein. Next step is he needed a protein snack after school, something that extra either in his lunch that he could eat while he was on his way home, or there needed to be some healthy protein snacks waiting for him at home when he got there. With supper, we suggested having a couple more servings of vegetables with supper, and a little less on the refine, on the carbs, a little less potato starch kind of stuff, right? So that he was doing a little bit better and another little protein snack at bedtime. So I was pushing to get at least five, four to five little hits of protein in the day. Things improved. And I knew they had improved when the mom called me with this report. She had broken her ankle and was you know, confined to sitting in a chair with her leg elevated for a couple of weeks before she could wait there on it. One day as she was there bored, she kind of said to her son, hey, you wanna play some cards? Knowing that it would last maybe five minutes and, and it would be over, but at least it would break up the boredom for her. So they pulled out the cards and it was Old Maid or Go Fish or something. And they played, they got all the way through one game that was impressive. He could never finish a game before. They got all the way through a second game. And then they got partway through a third game before he lost interest. Now, we did all that protein. But we also did two supplements with him. We used a methylated B complex. 
And we also used a supplement from Nature Sunshine products that is called Focus ATN. And it is nutrients that are specifically for the brain for people who, st who struggle with attention issues. Okay, so really, really great progress. Really great progress. This is a woman in her early 30s who I worked with about five or six years ago and then she came back. And uh, her contraction furrows were interesting. So as we were talking, when I'd met her the first time, she was married. And it was a marriage that was turning into a little bit of a nightmare. She finally was able to get out of the marriage and she was remarried to a man that it was a really great fit. And they'd had three children in about three and a half years, just really quick. And now she was feeling really, really depleted. So I asked her, how does stress show up in your body? And she said, well, right now it's kind of hard to tell because I'm so stressed and so tired all the time. And I said, well, how did stress used to show up in your body? And she said, oh, that's easy, miscarriages. When she was with her first husband, she had been pregnant three or four times and had miscarried every time. And I do truly believe that stress can cause miscarriages. So now that she was in a good marriage, she was just depleted. Um, it was an easy fix. Some high quality prenatal vitamins and a little bit of tweaking on her diet, which was already pretty good. And she was ready to roll. So I'm hoping this is making sense for you. Is this all making sense? If it is, let's have you raise your hand to make sure that you're staying awake. I don't know what time zones you're in. Some of you, it might be like 10 o'clock at night where you're at. So I need to make sure you're still with me. Good job. Thank you so much. So we do have, and we're nowhere near done our iridology, but we do have another round of the course coming up, Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology. It will be starting on the 31st of May, and it will go through the summer and will end late in October. We'll take off the first week in July to accommodate Canada Day on the 4th of July, and we'll take off the last or the first week of September to accommodate Labor Day as well. We'll be opening registration on April 3rd. So you might want to make a note of that. It'll be in a webinar like this, but we'll have all of the registration details as well. And we'll, that course, this course, Di Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology is all about learning iridology and learning how to integrate it with what you're doing. Like we've been doing tonight where we look at an eye, we see an indicator, your client has already given you a bit of information, right? When you start a consultation and they come into your space, you probably start after the hi, hello, how are you with how can I help you, right? That's usually the first question. What would you like my help with? So we take that information, we look at their eyes and we use that bit of information to start our assessment and to, to help guide the questions that the eyes are going to lead us to as well. All right, and we're going to teach you, continue to teach you how to integrate everything. Let's look at another marker, the cholerat. We're going to look at this in a couple of different ways tonight. Now, those of you who have the Jensenian training would call this the autonomic nervous wreath, right? In constitutional, we call it the cholerat in our dynamic iridology. So, cholerat correlates to a lot of things. It, one of those things is the nervous system. When the cholera is squeezed in fairly close to the pupil, like it is in this eye, it tells us this person likes small groups. They like, they have like one best friend and that's it. Um, they like solitude. They don't like big groups. They don't want, like lots of nose things noise rather they don't like being in big parties like these people would never go to a county fair or a rock concert way too many people they would go to a coffee shop okay do you see the the difference there these people get stressed but by big groups you'll never see them on stage because that's way too many people looking at them and even new experiences are stressful for these people they need to be taught and trained to be able to do new things 
and get over the anxiety of doing new things. So they need experiences that lead to growth. These people um, do really well with the nerve kinds of therapies. So sometimes that will be foods, foods that are rich in B vitamins, vitamin C, calcium, and magnesium. My favorite one for that is hemp hearts. Sometimes they do well with B vitamins, but I tend with these people to lean more towards aromatherapy and flower essences, right? There's nothing wrong with liking your own company. There's nothing wrong with liking small groups, but sometimes you have to go into a large group. And so we need to give you, give these people a bit of support with that. These people also tend to be very, they have a lot of anxiety about the future. What does tomorrow hold? Are they going to be okay tomorrow? They don't know. So we need to help them focus on being in the here and the now. This collarette is a little bit different because there are places where it's broken. We've got a break here. We've got a place here where it's obscured. It may be broken back there. Very thin and wispy here, almost a break. When we see that, we know that there are interruptions in the nerve feed. How will that show up? Anybody's best guess. So we want to ask them things. We want to talk about this. One of the most common things that happens when we have a broken collarette or an intermittent collarette is we will see a predisposition towards muscular spasms. So this could be intense spasms that lead to major headaches. This could be very localized spasms like a migraine headache. This could be a predisposition towards Charlie horses. This could also be a predisposition towards things like Parkinson's, so tremors of various kinds. So when we see breaks in the collarette, we want to ask, is there a personal or family history of any kind of muscular issue? Anything where there might be some tremors or some spasms happening? Now, if we see that, then we want to address that, right? We want to do things that are going to help the body to calm down. So again, your B vitamins are helpful here. Your calcium and your magnesium are helpful here. We also find that keeping the proteins balanced. So this is all stuff we've already talked about, right? But very important for all of this. Uh, anything that, that can increase the L-DOPA in the body is a good thing. So often that's things like limiting your computer time and your blue light exposure and things like that will help with that too. We'll also see restless leg syndrome with the broken collarette. Okay, so we want to be aware of that as well. The collarette tells us so much. On this one, can you see that we have the collarette but in a lot of places, we have another very thin fiber running sort of parallel to the collarette. We've got lots of areas where it's a little bit doubled in here. Can you see that? This is the strongest area. If you can see that doubling, would you raise your hand? Excellent. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Irene. Okay, I'm hoping you can all see that that bit of doubling, even up here, it's a little bit doubled up here. This tells us, for those of you who are really into gut, this tells us a ton about gut, a ton about gut. Doubling in the collarette gives us a strong suggestion that this person's intestinal system is prone to problems, particularly inflammation. So we want to be asking about the intestinal tract. We also want to ask about irritability emotionally. So are they emotionally irritable? Is the bowel irritable? And I don't necessarily mean IBS irritable. Just is that bowel a little more sensitive? If, we, if you find that this person's going, yeah, you know, I feel really thin skinned a lot of the time. Things just get to me really quick and easy. Um, and oh, I, when I'm upset, my gut just goes like, give me a bathroom right now or I'm going to be in trouble, right? So with those kinds of things that people then, 
We want to, again, work with the emotions. So that might be flower essences or aromatherapy. It might be EFT if you do emotional freedom technique. That might be another thing. And it also means that we're going to want to work with things that will be easier to digest. So maybe when they're under more stress, we need to teach them to go more towards homemade vegetable soups. We need to have them go towards homemade soups that are made with good homemade bone broth. So we get the glutamine to help heal the gut. We need to teach these people that when they're stressed, they need to really stop what they're doing at mealtimes and just focus on eating, relaxing while they eat to take some of the stress out of the gut. Okay, and so we really need to be focusing on calming them down to calm the gut down. So we've seen a collarette that was tucked in pretty close. This one is really expanded. In a perfect world, if you could choose how your collarette was going to be placed, and if you knew what that meant, you would place your collarette about a third of the way between the pupil and the outer edge of the iris. So it would be sitting right about here. Now, if you remember, we said that when the collarette is close in, that's someone who likes their solitude. They like small groups. They're more of an intimate person. This is the exact opposite. When we see a collarette that's this expanded, this is someone who loves people. They want to be in big groups of people. They love the energy of a rock concert because of how many people are there. They love the energy of a busy shopping mall because they just love all that all that energy that's with the people. They Oh, yeah, that's, that's what feeds these people. It's what fuels them. They love it. You take this person and make them spend a day by themselves, they're going to have a nervous breakdown. It's not going to be pretty. They need the energy of people. These people tend to be gregarious. You can take them to a wedding reception where they only know the bride or the groom. They know nobody else there. By the end of that wedding reception, you might know people like this. <laughs> they've got phone numbers for 12 people and they've got lunch dates with five more. Right? They just do that. They're just very outgoing. The challenge these people have is that they don't actually store their energy well. So it means they run out of energy. So they do a lot of crashing and burning. Now, how is that tied into the nervous system? Well, they run on caffeine and sugar. These are the people who four cups of coffee a day or more if they can, and sugar in the coffee, but sugar anywhere they can find it because it gives them energy, be it, albeit artificial, it gives them energy. So we need to change that with these people. We need to teach them that it would be far healthier for them and their adrenal glands and their nervous system if they were to eat small meals every two to three hours, keep the super high nutrient foods going in frequently but in small amounts, and that's going to keep their energy stable, and that's going to give them the fuel they need to be in these large crowds of people and have the staying power they need to party hard with their friends, if you will. So you've already learned a ton of stuff tonight from a lot of different angles, and there's more still to come. But I wanted to share with you what you're going to learn in the Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology. You will learn how to create programs right in your sessions and eliminate your unpaid homework time. You will learn how to do that base assessment in five minutes or less without lengthy intake paperwork. That's gonna save you time and it'll be a better intake assessment. You will learn how to only ask questions that are relevant to your client's needs. You will learn how to prioritize the problems your client needs help with. You will learn how to connect what you know about nutrition and or herbology with what you discover using dynamic iridology. 
And you will learn how to do a deeper assessment for more direction and understanding of your client's needs when that's needed. And we're going to do that through 20 live webinar classes. And there's a question, is there a contraction for on that one as well, on the last one? Oh, good question. Let's just roll back to it really quick. And yes, there is, absolutely. Good eyes, uh, that was Ursula, right? Good eyes, Ursula, well done. Okay, now let's jump forward. So 20 classes, two hours each, live classes. Each class is also recorded in its entirety and posted on the student website. So you can go back and review it. You'll have access to your student website for 18 months from your start date. Now, why only 18 months? Iridology is an evolving science. What I learned 35 years ago, well, most of it has been disproven. <laughs> and we've moved forward to things that have been proven scientifically. So that's pretty exciting. But what that means is that um, I like to keep things up to date. So at the end of 18 months, you get migrated to a, an alumni site that is kept current so that as information changes, you have access to it. So you don't lose out on anything, you just get moved to a site that is maintained with new information when it comes available. I just attended the three-day um, International Iridology Practitioners Association Symposium in Las Vegas, where a naturopath who has access to blood work and things like that has been, been doing some very exciting research and he shared that with us and it's stuff that has never been published before. You also get a digital textbook that's made available in weekly installments. You get cheat sheets where all of your course curriculum is actually put onto a booklet of spreadsheets so that you can find things very, very quickly without wading through two or 300 pages of textbook. Actually, the textbook's about 200 pages long. Um, instead, we've got it condensed down to about 50 pages that, and it just works so well. Each class starts with a review of the previous week Every class has lots of in-class practice and interaction. So it's a live webinar like tonight, but the big difference is the students have their lines unmuted. I keep the classes small, between five and 10 students per class, so we can unmute the lines and have ongoing dialogue during the class. You get a certificate of attendance for attending 80% of the classes live. Most of you have credentials with other organizations that require you to have continuing education hours of some kind. Because we do include nutrition and herbology, often this iridology course will count for up to 40 CEU hours for you. So that's nice, but do check with your different organizations to make sure it will. We also have a private Facebook group that is for my students and alumni only. I also have a public Facebook group for iridology, but there is a private one just for my students and alumni. So if you have a question between classes, it's a great place to post and get some feedback. If you have a way of taking iris photos and you're working on them and you would like some input, you post those photos and your classmates and previous graduates and myself weigh in on it to give you some support with it. And support via the monthly Q&A webinars. Again, if you've got a case that you'd really like to us to go into detail on, you submit photos or you need to be prepared to share with us an oral presentation of what you found in the eyes. And then as a class, we all chip in and help support you with answers to your questions. So the course content then includes beginning to intermediate iridology and sclerology at a level that will prepare you for the International Iridology Practitioners Association certification exam if you choose to do the exam. I have students who don't want the exam, that's fine. You don't have to do the exam. It also includes basic nutrition and basic herbology as they relate to iridology. So to be clear, I'm not actually teaching nutrition and herbology. You're bringing that with you already, but I will teach you how to integrate it. We'll pull from your knowledge and show you where to apply it with what you see in an eye. Ooh, let's look at some more eyes now. Yeah, yeah. Radial furrows. So contraction furrows go around. Radial furrows radiate 
outward. Now we've talked a little bit about a broken collarette or an intermittent collarette. Remember that just a few slides back? Well, sometimes the collarette is broken by a radial furrow. So this radial furrow is actually cutting the collarette. It's cutting it right there. What this tells us again is there is an interruption to the nerve feed, right? So it's, and, and the, these radial furrows mean other things as well. But one of the things they mean is, mean is that we have an interrupted nerve feed. So again, we're going to go back to that question of muscle spasms. Is there a personal or family history of muscle spasms? Now the location of the radial furrow is going to give us hints as to where we might see the muscle spasms. Now, you'll notice that there are other radial furrows in this eye that do not break the collarette they're not going to be implicated in muscle spasms. Only the ones that break the collarette will be. So this is coming straight down um, and adding to muscle spasms, enervation or a poor nerve feed to body tissue. This is coming straight down through the adrenal zone and into the top of the kidney zone. So when we see this, we know that the adrenals and the kidneys may be at risk for not getting enough nerve feed. So we'll ask, do you know if you've got a problem with your adrenals? And we're going to need to define what that looks like, right? Poor energy, inflammation, um, irritability, unstable blood sugars often go with adrenals that are not balanced very well. And going into kidneys, is there a personal or family history of any kind of kidney issues? Okay, so those are the kinds of questions we would ask for that eye. Now, what if we saw a radial for a look at this one going right up here. Starts right at the edge of the pupil, goes right through that collar way up. This is a head area. So I'm going to focus my questions on, is there a personal or family history of headaches of any description? Because if there are, we can explain it. And then we're going to work with nutrients, our B vitamins, vitamin C, calcium, magnesium. It's going into the head area. We may want to work, if we're herbalists, work with maybe some ginkgo to really take the circulation into the brain, right? We may want to work with, this may be muscle tension on the surface of the head. So we may want to work with some aromatherapy and some massage um, topically and see what we can do to ease the difficulties with headaches if that's what they're suffering with. And again, we always ask personal or family history of because this is inherited. This person may not at this point in time be having problems with headaches, but a parent may have. So as we're doing this, you don't have to take my word for it that the class is a good one. I don't know why there's so many blank slides there. I'll need to check that out. This is from Michelle Davies, who, like some of you, is a CNP and an RNCP. She had actually studied with Dr. David Pesek and had completed three iridology certificates with him. And she had also done iridology in professional practice with Darko Purse. This is what she says. This is the most amazing iridology course I've taken. Judith's course is top on my list. Judith is very enthusiastic and excited as we are in the course. She has many good examples and stories to share that make the, make the course that much more real in today's world. Judith's iridology course is very informative, descriptive, and complete as it contains the most accurate iridology, including sclerology, and most importantly, how to put it all together and make a proper assessment. I feel most confident in my nutritional practice now. Allison Taylor, who is also a certified natural health practitioner, said this, the amount of learning is enormous and there's a lot of depth to this course. Judith's teaching is professional and easy to learn as she stops for questions, has great slides and reviews every week. Her students are her priority and their understanding of the information is imperative to her. There's a student website page with all the PDFs for downloading and videos to watch. The page is easily accessible. There's also a private Facebook page for questions, comments, assessments, and just keeping in touch between weeks. 
It is a one-of-a-kind course. I would definitely recommend this course to anyone who's even thinking of taking an iridology course. Judith is a wealth of knowledge and a fantastic mentor. I love this course and I know you will too. And last but not least, Karen Choet, who is just preparing to do her final IPA exam. We're going to talk about the exams in just a moment. She says, thank you, Judith. It has been such a pleasure studying under you and learning from you. I really miss our classes, but I'm looking forward to completing this component of iridology and continuing my education, most hopefully with you. I've become much more comfortable with taking photos of my patients' eyes, and I have begun to implement this incredible work in my practice quite successfully. It has truly helped me immensely in my decisions and assessments. Thank you for sharing your skill, your knowledge, and your patience. Now, Karen's specialty is gut health, and so she's finding that it is making it easier for her to create her gut health programs on the fly when her clients are in her office with her. The enlarged pupil. Have you ever seen anyone who's had a large pupil? If you have, let's have you raise your hand. Okay, a few of you have, excellent. So if you've seen large pupils, why were they large? What are some of the things that cause enlarged pupils? Now, even if you haven't seen a large one, you might know the answer to this. So if you do, just weigh in on it. What are some causes of enlarged pupils? Yeah, stress, medications, both good answers. Anyone have any other answers to add to this? I'd love it if you did. Exhaustion, uh-huh, yeah. Absolutely. And if you've got more answers, keep typing them in and I'll check for them. Earlier on in our workshop tonight, we looked at what happens when the body is in the sympathetic or the parasympathetic mode. Low blood sugar, good one, Susan. Dehydration, yeah. And Ursula, oh, you've, you stole my next sentence. Stress and sympathetic nervous system activates it. It does. That's exactly where I was going. Good job, Ursula. Thank you. And so, when we see a large pupil and we have normal light and we know that this person has is not on medications that could do this and they have also not had a head trauma, we know that they are sympathetic activated, right? And so when we see this, it could be situational. It could be just that they've got a lot of stress right now. It could be that it's a young child Children often have large pupils because, well, everything in the world is bigger than they are, might be more intense than they are, might be overwhelming for them. But it could also be that this person is stuck in that stress mode, right? This, the enlarged pupil is not necessarily genetic. It can be situational, but a stuck situational. So when we see these, large pupils, we know, as has been sort of suggested by some of the answers, that this person is more prone to adrenal exhaustion. So you'd want to ask this person how they handle stress. Do they sleep well? Are they anxious? Are they aware of any inflammatory processes that are getting worse or more intense in their body? And then we would want to make dietary recommendations. At the risk of sounding like a broken record, B vitamins, vitamin C, calcium, and magnesium are key. What are some other dietary recommendations or herbal supplements that you would make to someone who had enlarged pupils and quite likely exhausted adrenals? I'll have you type those in, and I know that's going to take a bit. Uh, point form is great. Adaptogens, good suggestion, Susan. And Larissa says adaptogens as well. Great, good, great minds think alike, right? So we're looking at maybe some ginseng, um, some gotta cola, depending on their blood pressure, some licorice root, some astragalus. Holy basil is a great one. Very good suggestion, Lindsay. 
Awesome. What would you suggest for foods? Someone's adrenals are really tired. Are there some things you would have them stop consuming? Are there some things you'd want them to focus on getting? And I know some of you are doing the lightning fingers thing. Ah, Susan, good suggestion. Stop the sugar, stop the white flour. Helen says, get rid of the coffee and the alcohol. Those are great suggestions. Anything else that you would want to have them maybe include this time? Veggies and fruits and whole grains. Yeah, real food, right, Ursula? Real food. One of my favorite sayings is that eat food that will spoil, but eat it before it does, right? And of course, now we ferment them, which is not really spoiling, but it's not eating them totally fresh either. So those are great suggestions. Can you see how you already know things that you could easily integrate with iridology if you know what the signs mean? What about the constricted pupil? Some people have really tiny pupils all the time. And of course, this can be from really bright light. It can be from someone who is truly functioning in the parasympathetic mode, but these are few and far between these days. Most of us are just functioning on sympathetic overload all the time. When you see the, the constricted pupil, you want to ask questions about how they handle stress. You still want to ask those questions. And you need to listen to their answers and how they do it and, and even read their body language a little bit. These people can be really uh, changeable. They can be very rigid one moment and very flexible the next moment. So one minute they're digging their heels in and the next minute they're doing cartwheels to help things happen a certain way. They can go from being supportive and positive to being very sarcastic and very negative. So really polarized responses sometimes, especially when they're under stress. Did you notice on this picture there's something really wonky with the pupil? That the pupil's not round? Most of us don't actually have round pupils. The pupil changes shape based on our spinal alignment. And so what that means is if your spine has been out of alignment for a long time, the pupil tends to mold. And where it is flattened tells us where we've got misalignment issues. So when we see a pupil that has flattenings, we always want to suggest that our client get some body work done, some spinal alignment work, depending on what they're comfortable with. Beyond that, we want to look at where is it flat and any organs that are in reaction fields that are attached to the flat, flattening need to be looked at because they likely are suffering from poor nerve feed from the spine being misaligned. We also want to look directly opposite it to anything that sits in areas in reaction fields here and again offer some support there because this is also likely suffering with some pressure. I mentioned a few minutes ago that we would just run through the IPA certification protocol for any of you who might be ultimate looking towards becoming a certified iridologist. The IPA exam comes in three parts. The first part I supply for you. I give you 10 iris cases, 10 sets of photos to have you do a complete analysis on. This is not how we practice iridology. This is that case study scenario we talked about earlier, but it's just sort of the easiest way to see if you know what you are doing. And so you do that, you send them back to me, I mark them, and then we spend time together in a private tutorial going over your work. We look at all the things you've done super well, and we look at things that maybe you don't have quite right that we need to tweak before you progress to the next level of exam. The next level is provided by IPA, and they are just now making this so that it's available digitally online. And it's one case study that you do again, just like you did the first 10, but this one is sort of the final case study you'll ever do. And so you do that, you give it to me, I mark it, and then we spend time again in a private tutorial going over it 
to make sure that you're really solid. The last part of the exam is a four hour written exam, which again is uh, just going to be made digital within the next few weeks. In order to do part two and part three, you have to pay IPA an exam fee, it's in US dollars, and then they give us access to the things that we need. This is four hour written exam done online. It gets marked instantly online, so you know if you passed or if you need to redo certain parts of it. But you don't, uh, you're, this is not given to you until I tell IPA that I think you're ready. So I have a stewardship here, which I take very seriously to make sure you are prepared and ready to go. Registration for Confident Nutritionist, again, will be opening at a webinar that I will be holding on April 3rd. Although in between now and then, we have a couple more of these kinds of webinars as well. And again, it doesn't matter if you're a herbalist or a nutritionist. You've already seen tonight how we pull both in. I just couldn't call the course Confident Nutritionist or Herbalist Dynamic Iridology. That's way too long. Confident Nutritionist was easiest, but we do include um, herbology. I even throw in a little bit of uh, aromatherapy because it's a lot of fun to do with this. Why would you want to study with me? Well, I've been where you are. There was a day way back when I didn't know iridology and no one had taught me how to not do homework. No one had taught me how to keep my consultations down to the time that had been booked. And so I've been where you are. I understand also the financial and time constraints of running a business, taking care of a family, home, friends, other important commitments. I've done this while having and raising seven children. So I do know busy. I know the juggling acts we go through, right? But additionally, um, I know that it's really difficult to go and take a class for five or six days and assimilate all of that information and make it work for you. It's one of the reasons why I won't do that, why we do two hours once a week. You learn things, you go, you practice them, use them on your clients, come back, learn more, and build it slowly. I understand that we don't all learn in the same way, and that's why I've got different materials in place to support you. There's a lot to learn. We need to spin it out over a bit of time, give you time to settle in with the information. It's less expensive to study with a Canadian teacher who charges in Canadian dollars. Really, if you're in Canada, you're going yippee because you're not having to pay 30% more because that's the exchange rate for your class. And if, if you're in the States, you're going yippee because when it goes through your credit card, you're going to find out that the price that I will share with you on April 3rd will actually process at about 30% lower on your credit card. So it's, it's a win-win for all of us. I am committed to personally, personally rather, to your learning. You're not going to get passed off to a teacher's aide or an assistant. I am here to support you in learning iridology. So the benefits here, we're not even finished iridology. We've got one more uh, feature that I want to teach you about tonight. No more unpaid homework time. You'll be able to create your therapeutic sequences that will help your clients be more successful and keep them coming back to continue their wellness journeys. You will be able to eliminate your lengthy intake questionnaires. Your clients will love you for that, I promise. You'll be able to develop rapport within minutes. I've had so many clients as we're doing the iridology part say to me things like, I've never told anyone this before. And I tease them a little and say, you know, I'm going to know more about you by the time we're done than your mother knows about you. So, you know, it's just all good, right? And of course, you will be more precise in your client work. You'll get it right the first time. You're not going to waste time. Those are all good things. Let's now look at this feature called a sandy texture, this marking. Now, you're only ever going to see this in brown eyes. And the reason for that is that the... The thing that makes this look rough, can you see how this looks like sandpaper? If you can see that this looks like sandpaper, let's have you raise your hand. Have you click that little hand icon? Yeah, thank you, Larissa. Awesome. Can the rest of you see this too? I want to make sure that you've got an Ursula. Thank you. 
Okay, I'm hoping you see this. Uh, and Larissa and Helen, thank you. Good. Okay. So most of you are saying that you can see it. So that's good. So when we're seeing this, what it is, is the pigment that makes the eye brown has deposited, uh, deposited unevenly. That's why you'll never see it in a blue eye or in a light hazel eye. It will only ever be in a brown eye. Now, when we see this, it tells us that this person has problems holding on to their minerals. Now, could that cause problems with the nervous system? If they can't hold on to their calcium and their magnesium, could we see repercussions for that? Where maybe we have muscle spasms that don't want to release? You bet. So they may have problems. They don't usually have problems absorbing it. They have problems holding on to it to use it. So we don't want to use mineral supplements with them. Why would we not want to give them a calcium magnesium tablet? They can break it down. But why do you think we don't want to use a calcium magnesium tablet with them? Uh, Susan, I'm betting you're typing in an answer for me. I'll just give that a minute to come through. Yeah, it concentrates the minerals and you can give them a truckload, but most of that truckload is just going to pass right on through. So that's not going to be very helpful for them, is it? Instead, what we want to do is have them eat really nutrient dense foods in small servings throughout the day. Yes, Ursula, excess nutrients in the bloodstream. And they're just not going to hold on to it. Absolutely. So we want them to be able to just get a constant, steady little trickle of minerals rather than these big blasts of nutrient. Excellent. This one is a little more subtle, but you can see still that there's a bit of sandiness in here. So again, it's only going to be in brown eyes that you're going to see this. This is pigment that has deposited unevenly in the anterior layer, the anterior border layer of the iris. You might not see this with handheld equipment because what you're looking at on your computer screen is way more than a 10x magnification, right? So you might not see it with that, but you might, you just never know. So as you're just kind of thinking about that, and, and this was exciting for me to learn because where I live, there's not a lot of brown eyes. We have a lot of the light hazel eyes and we have a lot of blue eyes, but not a lot of brown eyes. So I've been really studying up on brown eyes just because there's gonna be more of those come through my door. I just know it. So when does Confident Nutritionist actually happen? It's going to start on Thursday, the 31st of May, and it will run through the 25th of October. So we go right through the summer once a week, two hours per class. If you're going to be away on a vacation, don't worry. It all gets recorded, stored on your student site. You can listen to it when you can. It is delivered by webinar. So if you're on a vacation where you've got internet access, and you want to log on and participate from some lovely vacation spot, you're certainly welcome to do that too. We have a morning section, so 11 a.m. and an evening section, 5 p.m. But when you register, you commit. You commit to being either in the morning or in the evening. You don't get to bounce back and forth. And I've chosen these times specifically so that if you're in the States, in the US or Canada, you've got lots of opportunity. And even if you're overseas, GMT is uh, Greenwich Mean Time. We've got a time that just might work for you, the 6 p.m. slot. So I hope you will give some consideration to that. But I also hope, in the meantime, that you will join me again on Tuesday, the 6th of March, where we're actually going to do some case studies with nervous systems. Again, we're going to look at some eyes where they're, they were diagnosed with depression or with ADHD or with other nervous system issues. We're going to dissect their eyes as far as nervous system goes, look at the questions, look at possible recommendations to make. 
Now, this is the registration link, but it's not active tonight. If you go there, what you're going to find is the registrations for tonight. Give me till midday tomorrow, and I will get this updated with the links for the March 6th webinars. So if you bookmark that, that URL, make a note of this, bookmark it. This is the URL I use for all of my free webinar, free iridology registrations. So you can just keep checking back on that and see what's new or uh, sign up for my newsletter, right? Which actually when you register through that link, it will automatically add you to my newsletter list so that you're always apprised of when the next webinars are happening. So with that, I thank you for your attention tonight. I've had a ton of fun. I love teaching this stuff and I love having fabulous class like we had tonight with such great participation. Thanks for doing that for me. And I hope you learned something and I hope to see you on March the 6th. Take good care. Have a good night.